It's all over in Australia. Was it something special in Sydney? Well, keep watching as I dig into what happened in the first test between Australia and Wales. Hello amateurs, welcome back to the channel. I'm here with you throughout the summer series and beyond. So hit subscribe down below to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now then, what of Australia coming into this test? A disastrous World Cup under Eddie Jones. A ton of players either ostracised or not picked. A new coach, Joe Smith. Possibly the complete polar opposite to Eddie Jones. A man who's stickler for detail. A ruthless taskmaster. What were Australia likely to do in these opening games, these opening minutes, certainly? I think simple. Set piece. Dominate. Just get things moving, try to keep the error count low and be really efficient. And Wales this week, we're talking about stripping things back a little bit, making more thing, things a little bit more simple for themselves as well, as they're still a very young and inexperienced side. So this game was lining up, I think, to not be a huge amount of free-flowing, not a ton of offloads, but very set-piece dominated. That being said, Wales started off with some real attacking intent. Um moving the ball very nicely and it led to a penalty after a no-arms tackle and a 3-0 lead for Wales. Funnily enough, straight after that, you see something or oh, something happened that you rarely see in any form of rugby, let alone test matches, where hooker Dowie Lake actually caught the kickoff. Um, very strange occurrence. Australia clearly trying to get the ball back quickly as it was a short kick. Australia did get territory shortly afterwards and they got penalty after penalty after penalty. This was a trend in this game and something Wales will certainly want to tidy up for next week. They were competing really hard but gave far too many penalties away throughout. Eventually, Liam Williams putting his hands ahead of the tackle situation before nicking it for, low, uh, for a penalty right under the sticks and uh, Noah Loaleseo stepped up to hit it but not before the referee had almost hit him when given the penalty itself. 3-3 and both teams actually when they moved the ball they were taking the ball really close to the line which is critical in uh, committing defenders. Owen Watkin did it first for Wales and got absolutely whacked on the gain line for it and then shortly afterwards Mason Grady returned the favour as Australia took the ball right to the line and moved it at the last minute for a great break around the outside. That led to an Australia penalty which was missed a very kickable one. Uh, ben Thomas the fly half, uh, kind of controversial maybe, or unexpected pick at fly half for Wales. Um, he was moving the ball around nicely, but fizzed one really quickly into touch. I'm not sure if it was because his shorts were too tight. They looked like they've been sprayed on. Um, maybe something for next week. Um, that, uh, But this led to a scrum, and Australia looked dominant in the scrum. They really, really went after it. Just a classic old school technique of watching, waiting for that ball to come in and snap and go. That led to a penalty in 6-3 to Australia. Um, and Australia at this time were playing really direct. Um, they were carrying hard. They were trusting their forwards. And let's not forget, Australia are not short of big humans. Taniella Tupo is an absolute monster. And it was him that eventually drove over for 13-3. At the same time, Gareth Thomas was yellow carded so it looked tough for Wales a man down 13-3 down and Australia with most of the territory and most of the possession but Wales did get territory from a penalty and from a kickable penalty wide-ish but kickable certainly they went for a line out catch and drive and they went for another one because they got another penalty from it they were shown real dominance in this area just being super direct down to seven men as well don't forget and it ended up with a penalty try for them as Fraser McWright uh, collapsed it as it was charging over the line for a yellow card for him. Massive turnaround and a brave call from Wales. Um, so fair play to them. They recognised their dominance in the mall and, and took it. However, line-out catch and drives are difficult without a line-out and Australia were really pressuring the Wales line-out throughout and stole quite a few of them. That's going to be a big work on for Wales for next week. Whereas Australia were winning the line-out, Wales are winning the kicking battle. Uh, they really were putting a lot of pressure on Australia. Australia kicked uh, shoddily a few times down the middle of the pitch. And one of these led to a Liam Williams 50-22. Um, yeah, so 50-22, Wales line-out. And uh, Gareth Thomas was back on at this stage. And they went for a shift drive and then a peel at the back. And you wonder... Um, 
should they have just kept driving straight on? Because that shift drive and peel was eventually knocked on. And you think, well, what's the benefit of that? You know, you need to, I think, show some uh, flexibility, some different options. Otherwise, you become easier to read. And I think just doing that, even though it didn't work on this uh, occasion, was probably the right, right choice to mix things up and try something slightly different. Australia, though, continued their strong dominance uh, with Tupo going through the middle of Gareth Thomas. Gareth Thomas, who I rate really highly, uh, Lou said, but Taniella Tupu was really, really dynamic in the scrum today. And this just goes back. I spoke about the World Cup uh, disaster that Australia had. They lost both their premier tight ends before that t- tournament. Tupu and Alan Alatoa, neither of which went to that tournament. And it's a huge factor the higher up the game you go, the more you need a scrum. And um, yeah, maybe it would have been different for Australia if those guys were there. Shortly later, Australia tried the classic Joe Smith play. Hit up in the midfield, come back round, have people looping all over the place. And then typically back inside to the fullback. But they tried the wrap and pop outside this time, which Wales absolutely shut down. Interesting that Joe Schmidt would probably think you know, that the, the, they would try this play uh, and but do something slightly different off of it. Didn't work out on this occasion. So still, 13-10. Game absolutely in the balance. And then Wales just went through a period of committing error after avoidable error. First, Gareth Thomas, who didn't have his best game, as I've said before, a big fan of his, but he didn't have his best game. He looked to pass the ball at the back, kind of stopped himself, then eventually just knocked on and threw it on the floor. Rio Dyer caught a ball and then took it into touch, which he probably could have left. Ellis Bevan dropped a kick, uh, knocked it on, and Dyer picked it up to give a penalty away, which was like, oh my God, those are so avoidable. All of these were really avoidable. Uh, So Wales were really shooting themselves in the foot at this point, but they weren't made to pay. So it was 13-10 at half time, and from the first half, I thought Dowie Lake and uh, Tommy Raffel's tackling were really outstanding. For Wales and just the Australia set piece. Wow. If they can get a set piece to link up with all the talent that they've got in the back line. The natural kind of Australian DNA that we're used to. Then they're going to be ferocious and very difficult to beat. So that Australian set piece was impressive in the first half. Aside from all defence I should say. But Wales started the second half dominantly. And with their strum struggling. What they did find was a way to be really efficient on their own ball. Quick hook from Dowie Lake, Aaron Wainwright Wainwright, up and away and getting it before the pressure could come on. Wales did that really well and a great way to manage not having the strongest scrum. Some really good carries from Wales led to a penalty in 13 all and they are right back in it until straight from the kickoff, Liam Williams makes an error, knocks it on and that led to massive phases from Australia. Again, going back to what they're trying to do at the moment, trying to be dominant, use their physicality, and it was working well for them. Wells defended well. They really did. You know, they kept hitting them, kept packing them, but Australia were physically dominant until Chris Shunza, who um, on the flip side was uh, was also very physical today for Wales, won a turnover penalty one metre out from the line. So it was a real ding-dong battle at this point, and um, it really looked like it could go any way. Going back to the point I made in the first half about players taking the ball right to the line before moving it, Australia did it really well and it led to a try for Dalgunu, who'd come around all the way from his left wing on a massive arc and it looked like he was going to get outside of, who was it, Uh, Mason Grady. But Grady was really quick to turn and get back. It then looked like Dalgunu should have passed it to Kellaway, would have walked in in the corner. He was tackled about five metres short by Grady, but somehow just slid all the way there and Grady couldn't find a way to turn him on his back or flip him or whatever, slid all the way there and just rested on top of the line for 18-13 and a a lovely try really in the end. Aaron Wainwright, who was physical throughout, does exactly what he did, you know, his his DNA is, just always wants to carry the ball. He made a clean break and it looked like he was going to put somebody away until a tap tackle just brought him down and a turnover resulted in that. Wales got another line out though, very close to the Australia line. Jim Botham, new onto the pitch, immediately on. Wales did a shift drive to the front and scored. Uh, Botham was delighted, obviously, and decided to headbutt Liam Williams in celebration, but it was ruled out. And this was really close, actually, really marginal. 
Wales used this tactic throughout the Six Nations to good effect. And I wondered then if opposition coaches were going to start alerting referees because they do, in theory, put a couple of people in front of the ball uh, and then shift to the front really quickly. The timing of this was really, really marginal. And honestly, I could have probably supported a referee making a decision either way on this, but this was a really big moment. Andrew Kellaway almost scored an absolute worldie shortly afterwards. Do you remember the Tyrone Green one for Harlequins in the Premiership? I think it was dry of the season. This one would have actually probably been even better because Kellaway was reaching, reaching, reaching as he dived into the corner to try and catch a cross kick. And it was right on the end of his fingertips, but just couldn't drag it back in. Shortly afterwards, Ellis Bevan, the Wells 9, who I thought was really excellent throughout, really like industrious, hard-working, but accurate with his work as well. I thought he was a really good find for Wales at 9. He almost got an intercept, but slapped it back towards his side. Um, Wales got the ball back then, and he immediately kicked a 50-22. Really, really tactically smart then from Ellis Bevan. Tom Liner made a debut for Australia. Two brothers internationals for two different countries i mean that's the modern world isn't it fantastic though for the line of family great stuff by them and in the second half the Wales scrum actually really really improved archie griffin was still on at 65 minutes and eventually got subbed at 74 and i think that was a big part of it he just got into the game and um the, the Wales changes at tight head as well Alatoa is a good scrummager, but he's not as dynamic as Tupo is. And Wales really buckled down and got better as the game went on. Ben Thomas, shortly afterwards, knocked over a penalty for holding on. Suddenly it's 18-16, really nervy. Um, and then there was a real good example of the detail that Joe Smith will bring, or the just the real cleverness. Australia threw a line out over the top. But they lifted two separate pods in the middle of that line out to, to make it look like they were trying to get the ball. The ball only just went over the top, caught and then passed back inside. And if it hadn't have been knocked down backwards to his own team by Tommy Ruffle, I think Australia would have stood a good chance of scoring there. But that detail in the deception, I thought, was a really nice touch. 69 minutes and Tom Wright... The elusive fullback went waltzing around Nick Tompkins, who was on in the centre for Wales. He stepped Mason Grady for a try that would have counted in touch rugby. I think you should maybe get extra points if that happens. You know, you actually score a try that would have counted in touch. But it's still just worth the five, but converted for 25-16. And this really felt like game over. Um, tough for Wales to get back into it from that point but they made a raft of substitutions including Hooker 9 and 10 and with those new substitutions brought a change of plan they went wide wide they flung the ball they just went for it and just played off instinct a lot more than structure I think and they caused some big problems actually um without ever getting too much you know without ever getting points for it but they caused Australia a lot of issues with this really fluid loose kind of instinctive play that they you know they're well known for throughout the history Aaron Wainwright during this period carried a kick forward and got hit so hard I thought his teeth might fall out but he just bounced straight back up and I think he carried on the next phase as well Wainwright is an absolute dog of a player he never ever stops uh offering himself to carry, carry him with intense physicality throughout the entire 80 minutes. This was his 50th cap and he had an absolute stormer. Wales continued to play all the way through to the final whistle, but as I said, couldn't get any change out of this Australian defence. Finished up 25-16. And I think each team, there's enough of that for each team to take enough positives to move forward from. It's tough to go to a place like Australia and win. This young, still very young Welsh team showed a lot, I think, in this game. They showed a lot of dog in, in, and, around the, uh, in, in and around the set piece. Their maul was absolutely outstanding. And they just looked like they had a little bit more identity. They looked like they were more on the same page today. Um, they were ferocious, but they could do... I mean, this is the age-old thing with Wales. They could do with a bit more power. Noticeably, Christ Shunza in the second row has come back from injury, and he's a lot bigger now. Uh, Aaron Wainwright, no short of power from him, but he did limp off in the final moments. Could be a concern for next week. Australia, what's their identity now? It is 100% for the time being, at least, being built around set-piece, 
and physicality. And they've got that. They do have that. It's not in their national DNA. That's not typically how they've played the game. But they definitely do have it. And if they focus on it and get coached hard on it, then they can certainly do that because they still, and they always will, I'm sure, have players in the three quarters who can light up a game. But for now, Australia is set piece, physicality, getting the detail right, a couple of trick plays or clever plays each half. That's what I think we'll see. And we'll see them looking to dominate territory and possession and tick away at the scoreboard when they get the chances. All right, I think it's going to be a thrilling game next week as well. There's plenty in this. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll join you there for a friendly conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there. If you don't mind, it helps other people find it. And you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next. And do not forget to get out and play.